Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Rubenstein, President of the Economic Club of Washington, D.C. Hello, I'm David Rubenstein, President of the Economic Club of Washington, D.C., and I'd like to welcome everybody to our 17th virtual event of our 35th season. Today, our special guest is the Honorable Jerome H. Powell, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, before I begin the interview of uh, Chairman Powell, I'd just like to re recognize a few special guests, our international ambassadors who are with us. Uh, ambassador Ashok Murpuri, Ambassador of Singapore. Rosemary Banks, Ambassador of New Zealand. Philip Etienne, Ambassador of France. Juan de Dianos, Ambassador of Republic of Panama. Martin Weiss, Ambassador of Austria. Author Sino Dinos, Ambassador of Australia and Manasvi Srisodopo, Ambassador of Thailand. Our upcoming events on Thursday, May the 13th at 12 p.m., we'll have a discussion with Rochelle Walensky, the Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Honorable Muriel Bowser, Mayor of Washington, D.C. May the 20th, we'll have Melody Hobson, the co-CEO and President 
of Ariel Investments. On Thursday, June the 10th, we'll have John Stanky, the Chief Executive Officer of AT&T. And on July 13th at 12 p.m., we'll have uh, Scott Kirby, the Chief Executive Officer of United Airlines. Please watch your inbox for invitations to additional upcoming events. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Jerome Powell, Jay Powell, to our conversation. Thank you very much for being here, Chairman Powell. Thanks, David. Great to be here. So uh, let me begin by talking about the state of the economy. Uh, your public statements to date in recent interviews makes it sound like you feel the economy is in reasonable shape to come, go forward from here, and you're expecting growth of 5 to 6% this year. Is that a correct uh, announcement of your views? Uh, generally, yes. I, I would say that um, the economy at this point uh, does seem to be at a bit of an inflection point, and uh, that makes sense with ever more widespread vaccinations, with strong fiscal policy, with continued support for monetary policy. You see the economy opening. You can see ridership on airplanes going up and people going back to restaurants. I think the March jobs report that we recently got uh, shows what that can look like, which was close to a million jobs in a month. So I think we are we're going into a period of faster growth and higher job creation, and that, that's a good thing. I would point out there's still risks. In particular, I would say the main risk is that we'll have another uh, spike in, in cases, perhaps in, a, uh, in one of the virus strains that may be more difficult to, uh, to treat. Now, we don't see that yet. We do see cases having moved up a bit, but that's something we need to be careful about. And I think we'd be wise to, to keep wearing masks and being socially distant, at least for a while longer. Okay, uh, when the Fed does uh, its analysis of the economy, you now have to look at things like vaccination rates. Do you uh, have internal experts that give you that kind of information of whether the vaccination rates is going uh, the way it's supposed to, or do you consult outside people for that kind of information? Well, we do have experts now. I would tell you a year ago, we, uh, we you know, we had to learn it. You know, so this was the, by far the most important economic policy in this entire event has been medical policy. It's been the treatment of the disease and, and the success of measures to suppress its spread and then ultimately vaccination. So that's been the most important driver of the economy. Uh, we, of course, all through this have consulted externally with lots of experts, but we've also developed significant in-house expertise over the course of now more than a year. Sure. So we do monitor that still very, very carefully, uh, of course. So let's talk about the president's uh, stimulus bill, the $1.9 uh, trillion dollar <clears throat> stimulus bill. Um, at the time that it was proposed, uh, Larry Summers, a former secretary of the Treasury, said that he thought it might be too big it might be somewhat inflationary. It was uh, the output gap is roughly $500 billion. This was 1.9 trillion. Uh, you, I believe, supported the, uh, the uh, legislation, thought it was appropriate for the economy. Do you have any concern that we are gonna be producing inflation as a result of the stimulus bill or do other things that might get you uh, to be more worried about the economy because of the size of that stimulus bill? So we um, at the Fed, we have very specific jobs. We're a creature of statute and we have very specific jobs that we handle on be, that Congress has given us. And that's for monetary policy. It's stable prices and maximum employment. We also supervise and regulate banks. We deal with the payment systems and all that. One thing we don't do is give Congress or the administration advice on fiscal policy. So I've never and, and we don't uh, traditionally take a position in favor or oppose to legislation. We didn't do that for the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And we didn't do it for really any of these uh, these acts. Uh, w w you know, uh, that's just not something that we do. We have a narrow mandate and precious independence, so uh, we we try to stay in our lane and not comment on on things that Congress might do on fiscal policy. Okay. Well, let's just talk about. Let me try it another way. Are you worried about debt and deficits? Uh, the debt is uh, pretty high, twenty seven trillion or so, and the annual deficit is now about two and a half to three trillion or so. Um, is that a concern to the Fed in terms of impacting inflation? So yes, in, in the um, over time and in the longer run, the U.S. federal budget is on an unsustainable path, meaning simply that the debt is growing meaningfully faster than the economy, and that's by definition unsustainable over time. It's a different thing to say that the current level of the debt is unsustainable. It's not. The current level of the debt is very sustainable, and there's no question of our ability to service and, and issue that debt for the foreseeable future. Um, I, I would also say though, that as a, as a nation, we, we will have to eventually get back to a sustainable path. That is something that is best done 
in very good times when the economy is at full employment and when taxes are rolling in, this is not the time to prioritize that concern, but it is nonetheless an important concern that I believe we will ultimately have to return to again when the economy is strong. Now, you have previously said, I just want to ask you if you feel the same way now, that currently you do not expect the Federal Reserve to increase interest rates before the end of 2022. Is that a correct view of uh, what you've said? So here's what we've said. We've said that we would expect to keep interest rates where they are today until three particular outcomes are achieved in the economy. The first is that the recovery in the labor market is effectively complete. The second is that inflation has reached 2% and really reached it, not just sort of tapped the base, as I like to say, but has reached it sustainably. And the third thing is that inflation is on track to run moderately above 2% for some time. Those are the tests. So we are really focused on the progress of the economy toward those goals and not on a particular time frame. When we get those three boxes checked, that's when we'll consider raising interest rates and that's when we'll, that's when we'll raise interest rates. Until then, we won't. So what you're referring to, I think, is we all write down these projections every quarter in the March, June, September, and December FOMC meetings, write down individual projections, and we submit those, we tabulate them and publish them. And most, most members of the committee did not see raising interest rates until 2024, but that isn't a committee forecast. It isn't something we vote on or, or act on as a group. It really is just our own uh, assessment. And uh, so I, I think there's a tendency of markets to, to focus too much on, the, on what we call the dot plot, the summary of economic projections. And uh, I would focus more on, on the outcomes that we've described and, and uh, as the best assessment we can make of our progress toward achieving those. Okay, but based on what you know today, uh, you would not expect to increase interest rates before 2022 or you're just not saying that yet. Well, before 2022, that would be this year. I think that would be highly unlikely. I, 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 I don't, I don't talk about particular okay. date. I don't think there's any use in that. So, but it, it really is outcome based. Okay. Let me ask you. Uh, last time the Fed did increase interest rates, um, it did so um, for a, by a little bit, and then it started um, shrinking its balance sheet a bit. Um, do you have any view on whether that's the right way to proceed when you begin to increase interest rates? Should you increase interest rates and then shrink the balance sheet later? Or should you begin to shrink the balance sheet and then increase interest rates? Do you have any view on whether one policy or the other is better? So what we did after the global financial crisis was first we, uh, we were buying assets and then we, we gradually slowed the pace at which we were buying treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And then we held the balance sheet constant for a while. After that, we started raising interest rates. We raised them gradually. And at some point we actually, and we held the balance sheet constant. So we don't sell bonds into the market. And we, we either, when they mature, we either reinvestment or that we allow them to, to run off. So that's what we did last time. I think if you look at the sense of our guidance, it is that we, we, will, reach, we will reach the time at which we will taper asset purchases when we've made substantial further progress toward our goals from last December when we announced that guidance. And that would, that would in all likelihood be before, well before the time we consider raising interest rates. We, we haven't you know, voted on that order, but that is the sense of the guidance is that it would work in that way. In other words, uh, you, will, you are likely to follow the same policy of not selling into the market the bonds you already have or other securities, but just let them uh, mature. And then that, that's the way you you'd, uh, shrink your balance sheet. Is that right? You know, th these are questions which lie ahead of us. But essentially, though, I, I would say it this way. We, the first thing we do is we, we say that we will gradually reduce the pace of our purchases. And then when, we, when, when the purchases go to zero, the, the size of the balance sheet is constant. And when bonds mature, you reinvest them. Now, then another step, and we took this late in, late in the day, the last cycle, was to allow bonds to start to run off. And we haven't decided whether to do that or not. It, it, we didn't then, and I, I don't think we now would ever actually sell bonds into the marketplace. Okay, um, let me ask you a little bit about the FOMC. People probably don't really know how it works that, that much, but how many members are there of the FOMC? So the, all 12 reserve bank presidents and all of the sitting governors, which is currently six, are what we call participants in the FOMC. So it's the Federal Open Market Committee, and we meet eight times a year. We're doing it virtually now, uh, and, but I do it from this, 
uh, beautiful boardroom we have upstairs. Uh, so all of the governors vote at every meeting, that's the six of us, and then five of the Reserve Bank presidents vote on a rotating basis, on a two or three year cycle, depending on which, uh, on, on which uh, district you represent, except the New, York, the New York Fed president always votes as well. So it's a little bit complicated, but the sense of it is that it's a balance between the Reserve Banks, which are all around the country, and the board, which is here in Washington, D.C., and is nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Okay. So in the Supreme Court, when they have conferences among the members, I think the Chief Justice gives his view first, and others, according to seniority, give their views. How does it work at the FOMC? Does the chairman of the board, you, give your views first, or do others speak, and then you give your views? It really depends on the issues and 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 what we're talking about, and, and, and you know, it's sort of up to me. We, we the, the order changes. It's not an order of seniority or anything like that. People say, let's say we're going to have a go around on the economy. People will say, I'd like to go in the middle. I'd like to go at the beginning. I'd like to go at the end. And we, we sort of make up a list and we hand the list around. So I will sometimes go first if I really want to make a point. Often I'll go last and I'll try to sum up and then say what I think the path forward is. It really depends on the situation. Okay. Um, I always worry about the secrecy. So I assume that you have somebody coming in and sweeping the where all these discussions are going to occur or when they're being done virtually, you have the best cyber people in the world to make sure that nothing leaks out. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, you know, of course, we, we realize that we're a very attractive, uh, you know, target for, for uh, hacking and cyber attacks of all kinds. And so we invest a great deal of time and money in trying to make ourselves as safe as possible. We also have very strict rules for FOMC participants and their staff uh, for the handling of confidential materials. Uh, I would just say you you never feel like you've done enough. I'm sure you feel the same way in, in business. You just never feel like you've done enough. But we, we try very hard to uh, to be as robust against those kind of penetrations as possible. Okay. So let me ask you about uh, the situation with respect to a couple issues you've talked about, climate change, for example, or racial inequality. Uh, the Fed has not historically been somebody that's supposed to be focused on climate change. And uh, you're focused on the unemployment rate, but not under the statute, whether it's minority unemployment rate or, or white unemployment rate. How do you assess those issues? Uh, do you get criticized from members of Congress when you say we have to worry about, or if you do say that, climate change or its impact on the economy? How do you assess these issues that are not really in your statute, but are now important in terms of determining how the economy is moving forward? So there, there are two different issues and uh, there are differences in similarity. So I'll, I'll talk about them in order. So uh, both, but the point is both of them we see only through through the eyes, through, through the lens of our existing mandates. We haven't gotten any new mandates. So uh, climate change, for example, the, the reason we're focused on climate change is that our job is to make sure that financial institutions, banks, particularly the largest ones, understand and are able to manage the, the significant risks that they take. And the public will expect us to do that. Climate change is just another one of those risks. And increasingly, the large banks very much realize that. If you talk to uh, leaders of these large financial institutions, they're very focused on what climate change is going to mean for their business, for their business model over time. So that's it's within the, the scope of that mandate. In addition, we have responsibilities for the broader financial system. How will climate change affect the broader financial system and markets? And so so we, 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 we see it only through the lens of that existing mandate. It's, it's similar with, with inequality. Um, we have these persistent disparities, racial, gender, uh, and other uh, disparities in economic outcomes in our economy. And they, they kind of hold the economy back. You know, we all want an economy where everyone has the ability to contribute to and benefit from the prosperity that we, that we have in our, in our great economy. So really the, our focus is on uh, those the, the gaps that we face, and we call them out, we talk about them. We've we've tried to incorporate into our monetary policy framework the thought that uh, that maximum employment, our statutory goal, is a broad and inclusive goal. That's a reference to to those issues. And also, I think we now realize that that uh, unemployment can go low for quite a long time without inflation being a problem, which will also tend to help those groups. I, on that, I would just stress, of course. We, aren't, we can't be the primary uh, policy organization that treats either climate change or inequality. Uh, you know, we, we, we see it through the lens of our existing mandates, but those are very much issues for elected representatives and for other parts of the government, more than they are for us. 
You mentioned inflation. Let me talk about that or ask you about inflation. Uh, the Fed for quite some time has tried to get 2% inflation, but really hasn't been able to get 2% inflation in our economy. Why do you think it's been so difficult to get inflation at 2% or higher? When I worked in the government many years ago, we had double digit inflation. I don't think we're getting that again, but why is inflation so hard to get when we have large deficits and, and, and a lot of government spending? So the, the economy has, has really changed since those days. That's, that's when I was in college. And I think uh, people generally attribute the, the quarter of a century of low inflation uh, that we've had to a number of factors. One, one is globalization, one is spread of technology, another is demographics and the aging population. All of those tend to lead to, to lower inflation. So what we have, in fact, since the global financial crisis for the last decade, you've seen central banks around the world really struggle to reach a 2% goal. And in some cases, you know, are, are fighting outright deflation. The reason that's, that's a, a, a difficult thing is that reduces the scope of central banks to react to the economy when it turns down, which can lead to still weaker economic outcomes, lower interest rates, lower inflation. So you can get into a, a cycle, if you will, that's, that's not a productive one. So we really want inflation to be at 2%. We want it to average 2% over time. And that means that we want to, we want to overshoot 2% after we've been through a period moderately and for some time after we've been below 2% for a while. Well, as you know, bond traders tend to focus on every nuance of everything you say. And so they tend to sometimes exaggerate uh, what you might have meant. But make sure I understand and everybody watching understands if inflation were to go a little bit above 2% over the next year or so, you wouldn't regard that as a calamity. Uh, is that fair? So we, we seek, um, because inflation has run below 2% for some time, we seek inflation that is moderately above 2% for some time, that, that's, that's our objective. Now, when you say moderately, that means moderately. We don't, we're not gonna put numbers on it, but so we'd be comfortable for, indeed we seek inflation that is moderately above 2%. And that's, that's very well known. Uh, and so for, for, for quite some time, many people were saying, well, you'll never get above 2% because it has been very hard to get back to 2%. Now, now more of the discussion is on the other side, as you know. So um, you are the first person in, in quite some time to be the chairman of the Fed who was not a PhD in economics. I think the last one might have been, uh, well, I think Paul Volcker didn't have a PhD, but he was trained as an economist. But since that time, you've had trained economists. You have been trained as a lawyer. Um, is that why you are able to speak in the King's English much better than the economists who've had that job? Because you tend to speak in ways that people actually can understand. Is that a conscious effort or is you just didn't learn uh, how to speak like an economist and therefore you're more easily understood? So it, I do consciously think it's very important it, to speak to the interested public in a way they can understand and to avoid jargon. So every discipline has jargon and it's, it's a way members of that discipline speak to each other to be very precise about what they mean. But when you use it with the general public, it's just annoying, it's irritating and it's exclusive, it feels bad. So I tried very hard to, enjoy, to, to avoid using, using jargon. And I, and I do think, I, I think if you look at surveys, uh, you've seen these, large public and private institutions around the world are really struggling to hold the faith and support of the public. And I think for the Fed, it's, it's terribly important that we do engage with the public proactively. We don't look at this as something we gotta do. It's absolutely essential to what we do is to speak to the public and the, the public's elected representatives in Congress a lot uh, and, and sort of gain our democratic legitimacy through that. We, we, we need accountability, we need uh, democratic legitimacy and to do that, we've got to speak clearly and transparently. I've known a number of your predecessors and I wouldn't say they relish dealing with members of Congress. It wasn't the part that they, of the job they liked the most, but you seem to actually, you know, don't dislike it. You've talked to a lot of members on both sides um, is that a conscious effort to talk to more members of Congress than maybe some of your predecessors? And do members of Congress tell you all the time uh, you should be doing this or that? And how do you respond when you know, you're trying to be polite to them? It was very conscious. But part of it just was after the hard work done by you know, Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen and everyone who was involved to get, to get the economy back to a better place and get the Fed back to a better place, I thought there was an opportunity to really 
raise our engagement and I, and I have. And so uh, I, I do spend as much, a great deal of time. I actually enjoy it. Um, I, I go into people's offices and I, I say, I want to hear what's on your mind. And I think they really do appreciate the, the, the dialogue and, and the, all that. And I appreciate it too. I feel like I learn uh, about them and, you know, they tend to be very interesting people and uh, they're interested in what we do. So it seems to work and I'm certainly going to keep doing it. So when I go see members of Congress from time to time, I sit in their waiting room for quite a while to get in. Uh, do you spend more than 30 seconds in a waiting room or that 30 seconds will be long? You know, it happens all the time. You Sometimes you go up there and they're voting and you sit there for an hour and, and they never, mm -hmm. they can't go and you go back and it's fine. You just That's just part of the deal. We work for them. I mean, we're a creature of Congress. We were effectively the, the House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Banking Committee are the statutory oversight over this agency in our government. So I take that very seriously. We, we, uh, we take our relationships with, the, with them seriously and we want to understand their concerns and we work hard at that. Now, as you pointed out earlier, uh, there are six members of the Federal Reserve. There's supposed to be seven. We <clears> haven't <throat> had seven for quite a while. Um, do you recommend uh, a seventh person to the president or do you stay out of that? And how does the Fed operate without seven? It hasn't operated, hasn't had seven for a long time. Do you think it's okay to operate with five or six? It's certainly okay to operate with five or six. So we, we were down to three for a while. I would say that was more like uh, we had to go to zone defense. You know, it was that was very very difficult. But with five or six, we're fine, and with seven, we're fine. The way it works, though, is um, of course the the president has the right of nomination, the Senate has the right of confirmation. We have no official role to play whatsoever. As a matter of courtesy, courtesy. As a matter of courtesy, um, traditionally, uh, administrations have, after they've vetted candidates, they will, they will, you know, perhaps send that candidate to be a, a governor over to meet with the Fed chair. It's strictly in their discretion to do that or not, but they have often done that, and then, and then the Fed chair really, they're not asking you to identify people. They're saying, is this person okay? And, and you, know, you, you sort of have a nice interview with them and, and give them your answer. So that's the way it's been traditionally, but really we have no official role and it's completely up to the administration whether they want to do that or not. So I don't think we've ever had a case where a chairman of the Fed later became secretary of the <laughs> treasury and somebody who was on the Fed board was later became chairman of the Fed, like you have. And so is it a little awkward to be kind of a situation where your former let's say chair is now the secretary of the treasury or does it make it easier because you know her so well? Uh, it's not awkward at all. So uh, I think, you know, I worked at treasury and I've worked at the fed uh, uh, secretary Yellen worked in, in the, uh, in the white house on the council. She's chair of the council of economic advisors. And I think both of us understand that fed and treasury have different authorities and different roles, but have a long history of institutionally working together. Uh, for the for the good of the country, and so we're it, and we respect each other. We respect the lines, very clearly, clear lines, stay in your lane kind of thing. And I, I think that we'll have exactly that kind of a we do have that exactly that kind of a relationship. And I mean, I have no concerns about that at all. And uh, how do you relate to the administration? Typically, uh, chairs of the Fed will have a regular lunch with the Secretary of Treasury. Sometimes, even the President of the United States will have some regular contact. How are you relating to this administration? Do you meet with the Secretary of Treasury regularly or people on the White House staff or the president? How are you doing that? So I think the, the, the way it's, the sort of standard way it's happened uh, has been this, that there's a weekly, you, it had been a breakfast or a lunch between the Secretary of the Treasury and the Fed chair, and it rotates back and forth into each building. That's now a phone call. And and so that's that's what I've been doing with Secretary Yellen. In addition, there's been a, an irregular but roughly monthly lunch with the head of the National Economic Council. So there's a relationship there. You know, meetings with presidents and Fed chairs are very, very, very infrequent and, and, uh, and not, not on any sort of a schedule. So I, and I have not met with the president. Uh, had you met him before he was president? Uh, you must have met him at some point, at some point in his life or your life, or you really haven't met him yet? I think I've shaken his hand, I, but I don't. I, I have not really met him and talked to him. Okay. Let's talk about what it's like to be the chairman of the Fed. Uh, you know, one day you're, uh, you know, a private citizen and you can go to a restaurant, you can say whatever you want, you can do, you know, anything socially. When you're on the Fed board and then you become chairman, are you constrained in who you can socialize with, what you can say at a restaurant? Uh, 
if people come up to you and they innocently say, hey, what's going on? What are you working on? What are you supposed to say? I mean, so how does how is life as the chairman of the Fed? So uh, people don't come up and, and say inappropriate things. That's the thing, you know, they, in fact, they mostly they don't come up at all. I think even even people that I know are, are reluctant to come up, which is unfortunate because I like to talk to people, but I, I haven't had any situation where people have asked anything inappropriate, even sort of unknowingly, you know, but it, it is a different, uh, you, you have security and, and, you know, you have to be very careful about what you say in public places. And, you know, it's, it's just part of this life is, um, is your, 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 the things you can do are limited uh, and you just have to accept that for the time that you have this job. But, you know, it's such a great job and it's such an honor to do it. I really don't think about that. So if you want to talk to somebody on a cell phone, you have to have a, I would assume a secure cell phone and so forth and all of those things, right? Yes, yeah. And, you know, in 24 hour security and all those things. So um, when you are, um, running the Fed in a pandemic, are you doing it remotely uh, from your home? I know you're now in the Fed building now, but have you been the last year or so mostly working it from home or have you been coming into the Fed and working from there? You know, we, um, so we had a pretty significant FOMC meeting on March 15th, which I think was a Sunday. And that was the last meeting that I did from this building uh, that I went home after that. And since March 15th of 2020 have mostly worked from home. And um, although lately I'm coming in, I find myself coming in two, three, four days a week, as a matter of fact, more than I used to. I'm not sure why that is, but that is the case. And it was, I would tell you, it was surprising uh, how well uh, our business and our business model were able to adapt to doing work remotely. I think many, many organizations had that experience. We certainly did. So most of the Fed staff people who work at the main building of the Fed are they coming in now more frequently or are they still working it from home? Almost everyone works, just about everyone works from home exclusively or you know, from wherever they are exclusively. Some people have, some people live elsewhere now or they, you know, they're, they're calling in from a, from a home, home someplace that isn't the one they have in the Washington area. You're coming in more frequently because your wife is saying, finally, it's time to get out of the house and go <laughs> to the office more or some of that, or she's happy there, there for may you be some of that involved. There may be some of that involved, absolutely. So how do you coordinate with uh, the heads of the central banks in Europe and other countries that are important? Uh, obviously, it's remote now, but are, do you find that you can still communicate with them what they're uh, doing? And do you communicate as well what you're doing uh, remotely? You know, it's, very, it's a very, very important part of the job, M more important than I had really understood, I think, uh, before I started doing it. And... Um, we need to know each other. The heads of the major central banks need to know each other pretty well and meet regularly and talk. And so that's what we do in Basel, Switzerland. Six times a year we go to Basel and we, we have two and a half days of meetings and, and there's no press or anything like that. So that's, that's what we do. Of course, we haven't done that since January of 2020. So we're doing it by telephone. And um, I really highly value those interactions, and I know my international colleagues do too. So we're doing it on the telephone now, and by you know by uh, you know the secure equivalent of a Zoom call, it's it's fine. That's what we'll keep doing for as long as we have to do it that way. I'd say it's better to be in that tower in Basel, having lunch with people, you know, seeing people in the hall, going for walks, and you know, you just you, there's just more time to to really meet privately and talk than there is on the telephone. But I, I stay in touch with a, a good number of my international uh, colleagues. And again, I place a high value on it. I think that that is a good thing to do. The Fed uh, director for the area of uh, that has, in, I guess, includes Wyoming, uh, often holds an event, I guess it's in August or July, where the major finance people come together in, in Jackson Hole. Um, and that's, again, July or August. Is that going to happen this year in person or you think it's remote again? I, I think they're thinking about that right now. So that's that's the Kansas City Fed and our, our great Kansas City president, Esther George, will be making that decision. I'm not sure where they're gonna come out on that, um, but we will hold, it'll be held virtually, I think, as it was last year, at so least in, I, in, in person. I think you said recently, the biggest problem that you're worried about now is cyber, um, <laughs> cyber attacks and so forth. Can you elaborate a little bit more why you are so worried about it and how does the Fed uh, protect itself. I assume you are uh, subject to lots of people wanting to know what's going on in cyber attacks. I assume you've got great uh, ways to prevent that, but could you give us, without telling secrets you can't tell, 
uh, some of the things that you were worried about in terms of cyber and how you protect your information? Sure. You know, the, the question I was answering was really, will we see a rerun of the global financial crisis with the banks failing and all that? And, you know, we spent 10 years, literally 10 years, strengthening the banks with much higher capital. I can't stress how much higher, higher levels of liquidity, much better risk management, um, severely adverse annual stress tests. And I have to say that the banks held up to what was a pretty significant real-time stress test over the course of 2020. So that isn't the main concern I would worry about. And, and it really is some kind of a cyber attack. So we, we have a great game plan now for banks making bad loans and you know uh, housing bubbles and things like that. We, we, we've got that, that game plan. We've got a really strong financial system and capital markets. Cyber is just a, it's the new frontier. And I, you know, that isn't, that's not a, a new insight. We, we spend a great deal of time and money, uh, you know, making sure that we are resilient, making sure that the banks, they spend a lot of time and money. All of these institutions are, you know, constantly under cyber attack. And, um, uh, you know, there's a, uh, within the government, tremendous resources, very, very capable resources that we work with. I, I wouldn't want to go much into it. You know, and we, we've historically, we've run, these exercises sometimes, you know, scenario analysis where we, we run an exercise and see how it happens. We imagine that X happened and then we get together in a group. Uh, so we'll do, we'll keep doing that, I'm sure. But as I, as I said before, you, you, it's one of those things where you never feel like you've done enough. Um, and, you know. Hey, let's talk about FinTech. Um, <clears throat> since you first got into the, uh, the financial world, the FinTech revolution has really changed uh, banking and financial services. Um, how does the Fed regulate some of these new fintech companies that are really not subject under the traditional rules to your regulation? Are you worried about your inability to kind of control some of these companies that might have an enormous impact on the economy? Yeah, I would say it this way. We, first of all, you know, innovation is a positive thing. It brings with it many potential benefits, greater financial inclusion, more efficiency, greater options. You know, technology can do terrific things. In the financial area, the key thing is that equal activities, the same activities should be regulated the same way, no matter where it is, what kind of business it's in. That's one thing. Another is it needs to be regulated in a way that gives consumers and users of that service a, the protections that they need. And so they have to understand what the risks are, what they're doing and, and that sort of thing. So I think with the growth of the you know, non-bank financial players, we have some work to do to understand and and and, uh, and and you know deal with those challenges. In the meantime, we have the legal authority that we have over banks, really, also over some of the payment utilities, and we'll use that. Um, but we don't have authority over many other companies that are that are now very much engaged in payments business and dealing with um, dealing with the public. And I think Congress is looking at the question of whether whether there is enough there, whether there's there the sort of regulation and supervision that they need is really there. Well, related to that would be cryptocurrencies, which is not quite fintech. Maybe some people might say it is, but cryptocurrencies have blossomed, mushroomed, uh, uh, depending on your observation of uh, the size of it. It's hard to know exactly how big it is. Are you worried about the impact on of cryptocurrencies in terms of the impact in the economy and the ability of people to use these things for nefarious purposes? So a couple of things. With we think of them more as crypto assets because crypto, what people call cryptocurrencies, they're really vehicles for speculation. No one is using them for payments, for example, like the dollar. What they're using them for is to speculate. It's like it's a little bit like gold. For you know, for thousands of years, human beings have have given gold this special value that it doesn't have from an industrial standpoint. But nonetheless, for thousands of years, they've done that. So Bitcoin is much more like that, and the cryptocurrencies are much more like that. They're not. They're not really being uh, actively used as payments. Let me ask you uh, about your own balance sheet. I didn't really follow up before. What is the size of the Fed's balance sheet at this point? You know, it's between seven and a half and eight trillion dollars total. That's it. I want to say seven, 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 eight, something like that. That's and uh, so is that the highest it's ever been? Yes. Yeah, it is. And under uh, President Trump, a legislation was passed giving you more authority to, um, in effect, buy securities, buy bonds. 
Have you used all that authority or has it been taken away? And do you need any more authority to, to do anything you want to do? So what you're, what you're talking about is the CARES Act. Right. Uh, we still have, CARES Act really gave us funding, which we needed backstop funding, backstop funding. Uh, to absorb any losses, uh, we had the we've always we have the same authorities we've always had, but these are emergency authorities with a very high standard for, uh, required for using them. It, it has to be unusual and exigent circumstances. Actually, what that means is it's an emergency and regular way uh, credit intermediation has just stopped. And so that that was the case for for corporations and for states and municipalities. And we stepped in. We still have that authority. Um, we, we wouldn't have been able to do the things that we did without Congress providing, uh, you know, monetary backstop, fiscal backstops to absorb the losses because we thought we were going to make trillions of dollars worth of loans. The truth is we didn't because when we announced the facilities, the private capital marks markets started working again. That's what happened. We effectively our facilities became a backstop and pretty much right away corporate bond markets and the municipal bond markets began to work ultimately very well. So we actually didn't have to make very many loans. So let me ask you about uh, the Volcker rule. One of your predecessors, Paul Volcker, when he retired later uh, was upset after the 2008 crisis about banks doing proprietary trading and uh, private equity investing. And so what was a simple concept became a very elaborate, I think three or 400 page regulation. In your view, is the Volcker rule working the way uh, Paul Volcker wanted it or the way that you're happy with it? And has it been an administrative burden for the Fed to oversee this? So it's, you know, it's the law of the land and our job is, is not to question that, but to implement it. So we've implemented the first, first try at the Volcker rule in I think 2013. Then we came back and, we, and you know, I think we learned quite a bit from our first approach. It is, it's a very challenging thing to implement. It's a simple concept that makes a lot of sense which is we don't, if you want to do proprietary trading and you know, sort of gamble with the house's money, don't do that in a federal, federally insured bank. Do it in a hedge fund or, or wherever you want. But so that, that makes all the sense in the world. Actually putting that in place and distinguish, distinguishing between appropriate hedging activities and underwriting activities is not so easy. So we came back with what we think was, a, what we know was a somewhat less burdensome and clearer Provision of the vocal rule in uh, you know eighteen or two thousand eighteen or nineteen, we think that's working okay, uh, and that was our intention was to be faithful to the letter and the spirit of the law, but to make it less burdensome and more efficient. Let's talk for a moment about the, something you said the other day in an interview that uh, when you come to work, sometimes you see people in tents living in in effect living in tents, homeless people living in tents. Um, your mandate is not to go solve that problem necessarily, but is there anything you think the Fed should be able to do or should be given more power to do to help people who are really suffering in the pandemic and related kinds of issues that that hurt the people on the lower ends of the economic uh, strata? We're not we're definitely not seeking any new authority, nor are we, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're not the, the agency that has the most direct authority over that. I, I just happened to see it, though, right here on Virginia Avenue. There there have often been a couple of tents we're at this end of town where there's some open space, but now it's big. It's, it's, it's a lot of tents and it's a lot of people and you can't miss it. You come, you drive by and you think, and it, it has to be because of the pandemic. It just has grown a great deal. And it really struck me uh, as I, it strikes me every day as I go by it. So how does that play into what the Fed does? Um, I think we need to keep those people in mind, really. You know, we, we don't have tools that deal directly with them, but you know, those are people, many of them probably were working in February of 2020 before the pandemic hit. And uh, I, th I think they need to be in the, in the room with us as we make our decisions about monetary policy. We, we need to be thinking that it's not just the headline in the aggregate, it's also the people who are at the margins of the economy. We just keep them in mind. Speaking of the pandemic, as you assess the economy going forward, um, you are using the best economic models that you have based on prior experience, but those prior experiences often were before we had a pandemic. So how comfortable can you be that the economic models you're now using to assess where the economy is gonna go is reflective of what is gonna happen post the pandemic? And I assume you think that people are gonna work somewhat differently post pandemic. They may not come to the office as much or other things. How do you assess your economic abilities to assess the post pandemic working environment and economic environment? I think the first thing to realize is that the structure of the economy is always changing. 
So the economy that we had back in college was one where low unemployment led to high inflation and inflation stayed high. It's very different now. And so we have to constantly update our thinking about the way the, way the economy actually works. Now, bringing that to the present, we're, we're coming back to a different economy. It's not going to be the same economy as the one we left. And we, we don't know exactly what that will be, but we have some ideas and we're going to be finding out, I think, here beginning now. One of them is that there'll be more, of course, there'll be more uh, remote, uh, working remotely. That, that's one thing. Another is um, uh, we've talked to companies and uh, big consulting firms who have, who, have, who have surveyed companies, and many, many companies have spent the last year thinking about how they can use more effective technology, perhaps at the expense of, of, of the number of people that they need. So do, that, do their work with fewer people. And that's a lot of the service industry companies that have been traditionally big hirers of relatively low skilled, low paid people. So that's a concern because we still have many millions of people from those jobs who were working in public facing service sector jobs. They don't have a lot of other skills or wealth. And so we need to be thinking about what, what they're gonna do and how, how are they gonna find their way back to the lives and the working lives that they had. Um, and it'll be different in other ways as well. I, uh, we, um, we'll be learning about that. And, and we always try to try not to settle on one model of the economy and think, oh, we really understand this because it's ever changing. So when you assess information about the economy, you obviously are gathering data all the time. And many of your predecessors really poured over this data uh, with great fervor. Um, are you convinced that the Fed has the best sources of data? In other words, do you collect the data yourself or get it from other government agencies, or do you subscribe to private services? And do you think that the world has changed so much in terms of technology that the data collection methods that you have been using may not be as up to date as they should be? Overwhelmingly, the, the data that we look at are collected elsewhere. Some of it's collected by us, but the vast bulk of it, the big important things that you see, for example, the, the monthly labor market report, that's the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's not us. So we don't, it's not like we're the CIA where we have a lot of private secret information about the economy. That, that's really not the case. Um, more recently though, uh, things were changing so quickly during the pandemic and the pandemic part, the early part of the uh, recovery from the pandemic that there were a bunch of sort of real time indicators of like, uh, like open table is a good example where you could get data from and know how many people were using restaurants getting much more high frequency data, we call it. So that became much more important than it had been in, in the regular economy. Uh, so the data evolve. So, but the bottom line is uh, that it's not so much the data, we're all getting the same data. It's really what you can do with it and the analysis. And, and I would say we have, we have terrific, highly motivated, highly capable people, many of whom have, have been focused on doing this job forecasting and understanding the economy for many, many years. So I, I think our analysis is as good as anyone's pretty much can be. It's pretty much state of the art. There are other outside groups that have excellent analysis too. And you know, we read just, just to get a disparate uh, range of views, uh, we do read those as well. To, to keep up with what the major banks are doing, do you call the CEOs of major banks or do they call you with ideas from time to time or is it done at a more junior level, so you're not really day-to-day -day calling Jamie Dimon or the equivalent. I talk on the phone with a, with a number of bank CEOs from time to time. In my case, it's always about higher level. It, it's about the economy, what you're seeing out there. And I, I would want people to call me if they see something that's worth talking about. I don't get into talking about you know regulation or supervision of their bank. Uh, there are other people at the at the board who do that, of course, but that's not that's not what I do. I you know these these are they're in positions in our economy and our society where they see a lot, and I find it valuable to to hear what they have to say about what's going on in the economy. Let's talk about your life outside the Fed for a moment. Um, you're a golfer. Uh, you know you weren't a single handicap golfer. You've told me, but you're a golfer and you've played golf for a while. When you're chairman of the Fed, do people give you putts that they wouldn't have given you before? Is that uh, very common or not? I would certainly hope so. Um, Does I that help your that, frankly, just for just for the record? No, I, I don't. I haven't been able to play. I've not been able to play a lot of golf, uh, unfortunately. But uh, that's part of the deal. And you are a bike rider, a cyclist. Um, isn't that dangerous for the chairman of the Fed to be riding a bike when cars are coming along? And you have a lot of strong people to protect you from cars that might be coming along. 
you know, I, I don't, I don't tend to ride on busy streets. I do tend to, I like to, I love to ride my bike and I, I do commute to work sometimes, but I don't do it on heavily traveled streets or times of day when there are, there's a lot of traffic. Cause I, that's whoever you are, you don't want to get hit by a car, uh, fed chair or not fed chair. So I, I'm, I'm pretty careful. And the most constraining part of your life now is it's just very difficult leaving the pandemic aside to really have conversations with people in the way you did before you were chairman of the fed. You can't, you know, talk to people about what you're working on that work so much. So uh, what do you talk about and how do you have uh, maintain your friendships? Uh, you know, I, I'm lucky to have some great friends and uh, you know, I uh, it isn't such a great burden, you know, I, there's plenty to talk about in the world. Although there are a lot of things I, I don't like to talk about, like politics in particular, try to stay away from that. Um, but um, you know, it's a, it's a fine life and uh I've got a great family as well. I have four brothers and, and four sisters and one brother. So there's enough to talk about just right there. Do they uh, laugh at your jokes uh, better than they did before or nothing's changed? No, they don't laugh at my jokes, and <laughs> but, but other people do, so fortunately. So if you were um, an average person sitting in Dubuque, Iowa or somewhere, and you wanted to uh, uh, know more about the Fed, what would you want to communicate as the chairman of the Fed to the average person who might be watching this about the Fed, why it's a well-functioning institution, why people should be happy about the Fed, and what is it that you would I'd say boil down about the essence of the Fed that you want the average American to know about the Fed and the way it works? So I'll, I'll say two things. First, the, the Fed is a non-political, non-partisan organization that tries to serve all Americans in a way that's really important, you know, to try to keep uh, to achieve maximum employment and price stability. So, you know, a great jobs market and low inflation, two really important things. And that's what we do. We try to try very hard to succeed at that. But the other thing I would, I would love people to know though, is you hear about the Fed a lot. You know, we, we get a lot of uh, notice and people write about us all the time. The truth is the really important things about our economy are not things that we can affect. We, we, have, we have a relatively short-term perspective, a business cycle perspective on the economy in the things that we can do Really what matters for the country's economy over the longer term is th are things like investment and education, which is investment in people uh, and, and uh, having a more inclusive uh, economy. So they're, 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 those are the things that matter for, for the longer run, much more than the Fed. So we get all this attention, but in reality, it's, it's the things that Congress can do and that the private sector can do that will matter much more for people's children than what the Fed does. Is it surprising to you that a system that was set up about a hundred years ago, uh, the Federal Reserve System, is still operating largely under the initial statutes and that basically the way that it was structured then is more or less the way it operates today. Is that a surprise to you? And if you were sitting down today and given the power to redo the way the Fed operates, is there something you would suggest maybe could be improved? You know, the, this was the, the third try at a central bank in the United States. There was the, the first bank in the United States and the second bank in the United States. And they basically failed because um, people didn't want to bestow a lot of power on a government agency in a, in a major city on the East Coast. They were, you know, the agricultural interests and the, the big country, they just weren't comfortable with it. In any case, both of those uh, died after about a quarter of a century each. And then, then there was a long time without a central bank. The reason this one succeeds and is, and is thriving, I think, is because of we're balanced between a board of governors here in Washington, nominated by presidents uh, and confirmed by the Senate with terms that, that are not coterminous with presidential cycles. So we're non-political, we're not part of the political cycle, but also 12 reserve banks all around the country who are deeply grounded in their communities and, and understand their communities, the states and the cities and towns where they are. So it's a much more balanced and uh, sustainable model. And I, I think it really works. And I think, you know, uh, I think because of that, we keep in better touch with, with the whole country and what's going on in the whole country. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't change. There isn't a fundamental thing about the Fed I would change. Uh, you know, it really, I think, it's, I think it's a great model for this very large country. Uh, with you know, with a quite a disparate, disparate economy and and uh, you know different different regions and states, so I think it works. As we get towards the end of our time, I'd just like to talk a little bit about lessons learned. You joined the Fed uh, in 2012 initially as a board member, and uh, later were appointed chair in uh, 2018. Um, I wanted to ask you 
What have you learned as a member of the Fed board member that you didn't really know before that surprised you perhaps? And what have you learned about the pandemic uh, and the way it's affected the economy that might have been a so-called lesson learned that the Fed has learned about how the economy operates in a pandemic? Well, I, um, I'm, in, I'm just about to have my uh, ninth birthday here at the Fed. So I've learned a lot in those nine years. I think you have to master the specific economics around monetary policy, and also you've got to master payments and regulation. So there's a, there's a lot to learn. And I, did, I went through all of that in my, my early years at the Fed and continue to learn a ton every day. So um, in terms of the pandemic, I would say this. Uh, the, the first and most important thing about the pandemic was, was healthcare policy, you know, which starts with the things that we did to shut down the economy, that not we, but that, 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 you know, the government did and that the private sector did to get the pandemic under control and then to get people to socially distance and then ultimately vaccines. All of that was and is more important than anything we can do. The second most important thing was fiscal policy. This was a situation where, you know, 30 million households are suddenly without an income and Congress had to replace that. That isn't a matter for, you know, monetary policy. It works by stimulating aggregate demand by lowering interest rates. That wasn't, you know, that, that would become important later, but that was not what was needed. It was fiscal policy. Fiscal policy came in and made the difference in this cycle. Um, then, then us, we were third. And I think we, we had three goals from the beginning. The first of which was just a stabilized thing, which I think we, we seem to stabilize markets after our, what we did on March 23rd of last year and also to provide some comfort and then support the economy when the expansion began. Uh, and then over the long run, try, try to avoid longer run damage to people's working lives and to smaller businesses going out of business and things like that. So those were the things we tried to achieve. Um, clearly we've learned a lot about the way pandemics uh, uh, work and you know, we hope to learn no, no more about that going forward because we hope to have no more pandemics. So uh, if somebody is watching and says, I, I really admire Jay Powell, he's working hard for the country and so forth. I'd like to be chairman of the Fed someday. Uh, what do you think are the skill sets that somebody should have to be a good chairman of the Fed? Should they be trained as a lawyer, get a PhD in economics, uh, maybe do investing work? What do you think is a really good background to be chairman of the Fed, like members of Congress, uh, like uh, other reporters? What is it you think is a really good skill set would make a good chairman of the Fed uh, for a future chairman of the Fed, let's say. Uh, interesting. So I think if you look look around um, the, the current membership of the Federal Open Market Committee, we have a pretty disparate group of people. There are people who, uh, who were attorneys, people who worked in the financial markets. We have a, a good number of, of uh, macroeconomists and non-macroeconomists. We've had people who were microeconomists too over time. So I think, I think any background I think you can do this job with any of those backgrounds. I think it really helped me to spend almost six years here as a governor before I became chair. So I spent, and I did almost every job here under, under Chairman Bernanke and Chair Yellen. So I knew a lot about the operations of the Fed. I knew the people. So uh, I think all of those things came together to, to, to make me comfortable in, in wanting to do this job in the first place. So um, for those people who are wondering, um, how does one get to do an interview with the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board? Well, I, I have interviewed uh, Chairman Powell before, but uh, most recently it was a matter of coincidence and I'll just end with that so you can comment on it. I uh, had to go in early to see my dentist and the only other person early that day going in to see the same dentist was Chairman Powell. Of course, I knew when he was there that I wouldn't be getting my teeth cleaned as quickly as he's would because he'd be ahead of me. So that's OK. No problem. I understand Washington. But uh, had we not met at that, that dentist, we might not have gotten this interview. So I want to thank you for using the same dentist that I'm using, who's a very good dentist. And thank you for agreeing to let this uh, interview go forward. And I appreciate uh, your hard work and your public service. And Jay, thanks very much for doing this. David, thanks very much. Always a pleasure. Great to see you. See you at the dentist. OK. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, well, thank you all for paying attention. We have our sponsors now on our screen and I appreciate everybody uh, uh, who tuned in today. Thank you.